Hello and welcome to Diplomata. I'm Francis Suni. In this episode, we will meet an extraordinary diplomat, the man who helped to change the world's perspective on the case of Timor Leste's fight for freedom, the man who made the world believe that this tiny country could be independent. For 24 years, he was one of the strongest voices of the voiceless Timorese. Thank you very much, Dr. for giving us your time to do this interview. Uh, it is a great honor to uh, us to, to do this. This will be a very interesting conversation on your career in, uh, in the dip diplomacy. But if I may, I would like us to go back all the way to your childhood. You, how was it leaving as a boy in Timor-Leste? Uh, well, I, uh, as a child, I uh, grew up not in Dili, in uh, Bariki, Soibada, La Cluba, and then later in Atsabe, later in uh, Laga, uh, but primarily in uh, Manatutu district. I went to Soibada uh, for uh, elementary school from uh, ABC. Uh, school to uh, finish uh, elementary school then uh, came to Dili for high school because there is only one uh, high school in Dili and that's how uh, my childhood with many brothers and sisters uh, and then uh, to high school then I start working uh, then in 1970, I went to Mozambique because I had problems with the Portuguese government. I worked as a journalist here in Timor and in Mozambique. Came back. What made you decide to be a journalist? Well, I remember from age 13 or 14, uh, when someone asked me, a priest, and I can remember, I can tell you uh, who asked me, uh, Father Locatelli, because he and the bishop at the time visit Laga. And uh, I was there as a teenager. He asked, what would you like to do when you grow up? I said, I want to be a journalist. I don't know why I want to be a journalist. Uh, uh, no particular reason, I was just fascinated by it. And then I started working in Dili uh, when I finished high school uh, to write uh, small things. Um, many were not even published because they didn't think it was good quality. Uh, then I worked in radio uh, and the television, for Portuguese television, I learned to film with a very nice, good Portuguese military man. He was an army captain. And uh, because I heard that he is a very good cameraman, very good photographer. So I went on my own all the way to Quartel General. I went there, I introduced myself. Bon dia, boa tarde, senhor capitão. Uh, eu venho aqui pedir uh, ajuda. I came here to ask you help. Can you teach me about photography and uh, camera and television? And he immediately said yes, very patient for many weeks, many months. And uh, so I start writing, doing pictures. I start sending films to RTP in Portugal. Uh, but first, nothing is special, not political. Uh, uh, I already liked uh, uh, images when I film, even for uh, even for uh, news, because for news you don't worry to be artistic. But I remember one day I was in a land cruiser, in uh, going to Swai, and then there were many Timorese on horses uh, with traditional uh, horses, traditional clothing. I look at the mirror of the car, Lane Cruiser, I saw them. So I film through the mirror in a very artistic way. Uh, so 
that my first experience in that even when you do reportage, you can try to be artistic, uh, creative. Uh, but anyway, that's the, what I wanted to do. How was the freedom when you 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 covered stories? Were you were you free uh, to to do your own stories, to decide your own topics, to report? Well, first let me say I don't like to lie. You know, some people they like to uh, lie. <laughs> In the sense, uh, there was no freedom, and uh, I was very courageous, and I criticized the government. No. Yes, uh, zero freedom in terms of uh, journalism or intellectual academic expression. Uh, but I was not yet very uh, politically conscious. I was happy to do TV reportages of the governor visiting here and there. He always called me to go and I went and so on. My critical uh, journalist began, I don't remember, maybe I was 19 years old, uh, 20, when I wrote something for Asiara. Asiara was from the Dili Diocese, fortnight paper. The editor was the late Monsignor Father Martinho da Costa Lopez. I wrote, I sent it to him, he changed a lot to make it softer, uh, but then uh, I still had problems. The title was Maubere, My Brother. And uh, I said something like this. Uh, it was, I wrote on a Sunday, and I wrote something like this. Today is Sunday. Many people went to the church, and they pray, and they say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa. Me, I'm here in these four walls, uh, half drunk, because I had drank some beers, half drunk, and I'm thinking of you. You who work hard, even on Sundays, your sweat moist the soil, you know, the sweat moist the soil, and uh, the betel nut, the color is like blood, also uh, fall onto the floor and the ground, etc., etc. Then I ended like this. Maubere, my brother. The sun has risen already up. Its rays, its lights is also for you. Please rise up. It is time. Wow. <laughs> so, the newspaper came out. The Portuguese pity. Immediately stopped it. Confiscated. But some copies came out. A Portuguese military, at the time, the Portuguese military, the young people, they were against the regime in Portugal. And he came to me and said, gave me a copy. That's why I know Father Martinho de Coslopes. To make it a bit softer, he uh, uh, edited. But still, the end. So the governor called me to his office. He was very angry with me. He said, what do you mean? It is time to rise up. And he said, this is very subversive, very revolutionary. I gave a very stupid uh, explanation, excuse. I said, Governor, <laughs> you understand, the Timorese are lazy. I'm telling them, please get up, the sun already rise, go and work. He said, you think I'm stupid, you're joking with me? <laughs> you're making fun of me. So. <clears throat> That was my one, my uh, political uh, writing. Another one I wrote was against uh, the gambling. Uh, because one evening I was driving a motorbike, going to Taivesi, going home. Back then, like 10 p.m., no one in the street. 
and uh, in Kulung, a woman stopped me. Simple, local woman stopped me, and she said, uh, "I lost a lot of money in uh, the machine. I go home now. Uh, my husband will beat me up. Can you help?" And uh, so I gave her uh, some money. I remember 20 scudos. Uh, 20 scudos, maybe today is 20 dollars, or I don't know uh, how much. Then the next day I wrote an article against the slot machine. Because the poor are the ones who play. Because the poor are the ones who dream to get the lottery, to uh, be rich. The rich, they don't uh, play. You know, in China, many rich people, they play. So these are some of the articles I wrote. What shaped your political views at the time as a young journalist? Well, you know, interesting enough, I learned about social democracy with a Swedish tourist who was visiting Timor-Leste. <laughs> he was a backpacker. Back then I always contact uh, foreigners. Australians, Americans, uh, Japanese, anyone who you approach and they are nice, they talk to you. Even French people, I try to practice French a bit more difficult because I remember I found three French people here and I would go and uh, Bonjour, Monsieur, Bonsoir, Monsieur. <laughs> I start, start back. Oh, I see an Australian. Hello, Mister. Like today, some children. Hello, Mister. <laughs> Hello, mister, how are you? <laughs> and, uh, but then I met the Swedish, I, I don't remember exactly how we met. And uh, <clears throat> uh, he told me about social democracy in Sweden, in the Scandinavian countries. Then I read a bit more. And then there was a Portuguese gentleman here during the Portuguese time. His name is Angelo Correa. He was the uh, assessor to the governor. Uh, he was already a top political leader in Portugal, although he was very young. And he was one of the founders of the Partido Social Democrata in Portugal, which is the biggest, you know. And he became minister in Portugal. He was the one who told me about social democracy. But because he uh, he uh, knew I was already interested. So that was my, and why I went for social democracy. Well, in, uh, in the wall, through generations, some centuries, till today, uh, you can roughly divide philosophies, political ideologies, uh, uh, politics, uh, economics, in three major camps. Right, uh, right wing, right, uh, meaning capitalism, conservative capitalism, uh, and then you have a very left, which can be Marxist-Leninism, socialism, democratic socialism, and then a bit closer to the center, between the center and uh, the left, you have social democracy. But social democracy also some a bit more conservative, some a bit more left. Like uh, labor parties, usually they are more or left. Uh, social democratic parties, usually a bit more conservative. But they all belong to the political family, political doctrine of social democracy. And why? Well, I didn't like American-style capitalism that provide very little or no social security support to the poor people. Workers have uh, limited rights. Then you have a communist. From what I read at the time, Marxist-Leninist, regimes at Marxist-Leninist, uh, no freedom and mostly has been economic failure. So I decided to be more or less in the center. I never changed till today. Tell me about the first days when you 
you were being one of the, the leaders at the time in the political world uh, of Timor-Leste. Um, what was the motivation? Well, the motivation was, as maybe I expressed in the letter, the, the article, open letter to Maubrere, my brother. Uh, I didn't have any real ideology, you know. And uh, till today, I know, I don't engage in ideological debates. I go for what I see is the best for the poor, uh, for the disfranchised, for the people who are discriminated, and how you can be best help. Well, the left doesn't have a monopoly on virtues. The right doesn't have a monopoly on sins of virtues. The center also. I, throughout my life, I have found many conservative people around the world, particularly in the United States, in Australia, in Portugal, and in France, very good people, very compassionate, with a great heart. They are very conservative ideologically, politically, but with a great heart. They are Christian, uh, very religious, but they are conservative. And I found, so I found many uh, American Republicans, very good, very supportive of Timor. They are Republicans. As I found many Democrats, obviously. So I was never uh, very much an uh, ideological uh, person and I continue to refuse. Uh, and I can criticize the United States, and I do, uh, but I also see uh, there's a lot of uh, qualities, virtues uh, among American society, American political system, uh, you know, unlike one party states, whether uh, one party states, religious states like Saudi Arabia or Iran. Iran is not exactly one party state, it's more open, more democratic than uh, Saudi Arabia uh, or North Korea. Uh, or any other during, like in Suharto time, or in Indonesia, or Marcos in the Philippines. Well, you cannot talk much. Uh, you cannot criticize the government. Uh, that's in the extreme left, but also in the extreme right. But in the United States, you can disagree with uh, the policies of the U.S. administration. Like today, you look at the American media, the U.S. Congress, every single day, they fight the president, but no journalist goes to jail, everyone continues to talk. So an incredible, uh, healthy, dynamic democracy. Uh, but often I criticize also. Uh, and I criticize because the U.S. is a global power, a superpower. It has global responsibilities. It has global privileges because it the American economy depends also a lot from uh, the rest of the world. And, uh, and whether we like it or not, uh, the U.S. is a real superpower in every sense, not only military and not only economics, in their brains, in their inventions, in their uh, science, in their engineering, etc., etc. Uh, <clears throat> But also, uh, you know, the Chinese system, well, they change when you compare to the Mao era, the Mao revolution, Maoist revolution, cultural revolution, and uh, today, much more open than uh, before. And uh, so I, uh, I never uh, uh, fell into the trap of uh, ideological purity, uh, that I'm the one who is right and the others are wrong. No, I, I listen if uh, then common sense tell you no, he or she is right. We better uh, listen more, uh, better study. Uh, but this time he or she is not right. You know, because not a person cannot be always right, you know. Uh, so uh, that's how I I have always were, and I, I'm still is. And sometimes people think, well, Ramos Orta is left, right, left, right. 
I say, no, just because I'm not ideological, I'm not dogmatic, I'm not stubborn. I see how I can uh, move to help, to move on. And uh, in life, you cannot be dogmatic. You have to uh, work with the left, work with the right. Uh, you cannot find evil in one place and angels in another. No. In the world, you have uh, uh, very good people, some very bad people, not, some not so good, some not so bad. So that's how I am. We'll go into more details on your uh, diplomacy work throughout the period of uh, Timor's struggle for independence. But just to end this first segment of the interview, um, what do you do these days? Well, uh, these days, not much really. I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, I, until uh, when I left office in 2012, I wanted to help. I didn't want to leave the country. So I approached Mr. José Luis Guterres, uh, he was the new foreign minister. I approached uh, then President Tauro Mataruak, and uh, I wrote to Maung Bolsonaro a letter, and I said, I'm available uh, to help in whatever capacity. And uh, there was no response from anyone. Uh, but before that, I already had invitation from Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And uh, so, because I had no response from anyone, any leader in the country, because I wanted to help as a former president, uh, I then went to Guinea-Bissau. I was appointed as Under Secretary General, the Special President of Secretary General, and I went to Guinea-Bissau. I spent 18 months there. I came back. Again, I uh, told uh, uh, the leaders I'm available to help. And uh, one issue I wanted to help was to resolve the situation of our people in West Timor. The refugees who are still there in Atambua, Kupang, uh, and I told President Taumatar work, and I told many others uh, in writing, until we resolve this problem, the process of reconciliation, it cannot be considered completed. And I'm ready to volunteer to, do, to help resolving this. Thank you very much for staying with me, Francis Uni on Diplomata. Doctor, you represented Timor-Leste uh, during the struggle of uh, Timor-Leste struggle for independence in the International Forum. Can you share us your story uh, on, on your work? Following the unilateral declaration of independence by Fred Lin Central Committee and on November 28, 75, The President, Xavier Amaral, and Nicola Lovato, uh, <clears throat> as the leaders, as the two main, uh, you can call, proclamators, proclamadores. Of course, the, the proclamation was made by the Comité Central, not by two people. Uh, in the Declaration of Unilateral Independence, you can see a enorme do Comité Central da Fredeli. So, uh, <coughs> we had uh, the two as the main, because you have a president of Fredeli, vice president of Fredeli, then you have Central Committee. And then, following the Declaration of Independence, and uh, on the basis of the uh, Constitution that we uh, also proclaim, a government was formed with Nicola Lobato as Prime Minister. The political system is still the same then and today, semi-presidential system. So it was Nicola Lobato that uh, formed the government. I was invited to be Minister of Foreign External Relations and the Information, uh, 
Mr. Maria Alcatiri, Dr. Maria Alcatiri, was invited as the Minister of State for Political Affairs. We had two senior ministers, Minister of Estado for Assuntos Economic Sociais, Abilio Araújo, an economist, and uh, Maria Alcatiri, uh, Minister of State for Political Affairs. And each of them, they supervise a number of uh, ministries. My mission was very clear. I remember Nicolò Lobato said his very own words, Orta vai para Nações Unidas defender a nossa causa. Ramos Orta, Orta, you go to the United Nations to defend, advocate our cause. Maria Alcatiri went to Mozambique. Mozambique had just become uh, independent and uh, to work with Mozambique so that uh, we can uh, mobilize the African continent, the African countries, uh, and others. But uh, that is only theoretical, because uh, while it's relatively easy or easy to travel in Europe, how are you going to travel in Africa? Uh, particularly 50 years ago, 40, uh, 40 years ago, it was extremely difficult uh, to cover the African continent. Uh, so, to cover the African continent, we also did either in the United Nations, where all the missions are there, or in the non-aligned movement meetings, so where are all the Africans are there. Uh, so, uh, and uh, Roger Lobato was uh, also sent out to procure uh, some uh, material support for us. But we were not alone. We, outside, we then, uh, join up with Abilio Araujo. He was already in, in Lisbon uh, to complete his studies in economics, but he was uh, active with the Solidarity Movement in Portugal. Uh, then uh, Roque Rodriguez, he had, been, he had already left before uh, as our representative in Mozambique. Roque was first in Mozambique for several years and then went to Angola, where he stayed longest. And these are the main uh, political leaders who went out of the country. But uh, outside was also José Luis Guterres. He was part of the founding members of uh, ASDT, Fratelli, but he went also to study. And uh, so he was a member of the Central Committee from day one. And uh, so great, then he joined also us. And, uh, <coughs> Then uh, many of the Timorese students in Lisbon, who were members of Fratelli, all went to Mozambique to study. And it was uh, thanks to Fratelli, to Mozambique, because uh, after the Portuguese Revolution, the situation was chaotic, very difficult for the Timorese to continue to study there, and for financial economic reasons. And we talked to the government of Mozambique, and everybody was taken to Mozambique. I don't remember how many, more than 30, probably. So we owe a lot to Mozambique, as we owe a lot to Angola. And the Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa, they were on the front line of supporting us at the United Nations. And the, but do not forget the role of Portugal. If Portugal had abandoned us diplomatically, I don't think even Mozambique, Angola, the Portuguese speaking country in Africa could save us diplomatically. And uh, so Portugal, as the, an European power, as a NATO member, as the administering power, to be more or less, was the one that took the case to the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly. And, uh, but at the time, Portugal was also weak after the revolution. Uh, every six months, 12 months, there was a new government. Uh, only by 1987, there was a majority government led by Professor Cavaco Silva. Because when Portugal was still unstable because of the revolution, 74, 75, difficult for them to have influence, difficult for them to concentrate on Timor-Leste, because there are so many problems in Portugal itself. But they still did, they still helped us, they still fought at the United Nations. 
So it was not me alone, or uh, José Luis Guterres, or Maria Alcatiri, no, many other Timorese uh, working in different areas. You know, I was in New York, but others start building solidarity in Portugal, others in Australia. And not only Fred Lim, but many UDT people, uh, Timorese Democratic Union, Union Democratic Timorese, particularly Mr. João Carscalão, Sr. Domingos Oliveira, uh, Zacharias Costa, Milena Pires, because before they were members of UDT, uh, before uh, uh, 99. Uh, and uh, so we tried to work together, all the Timorese, trying to heal the wounds from the civil war. In the beginning, in Australia, in Portugal, a lot of tension between Fratellini and Uriti. Slowly, we went there, I went there. In the beginning, I was a bit afraid, you know, uh, but then we embraced each other and started working together. <sighs> and in New York, at the United Nations, well, I have to confess, I'm not going to say I was immediately an expert about the UN. I read about the Charter, I read about the structure of the UN, theoretically. I knew a bit about international politics, but by instinct, by uh, thinking. And uh, one example, you know, my first international act of diplomacy was to Indonesia. June 74, I went from here to Kupang. I met with Gubernur El Tari, Brigadier General El Tari, who was a friend of mine. Why? Because during the Portuguese time, Portugal was still here, El Tari was governor. I was already visiting El Tari. Uh, and I was the one who uh, persuaded the Portuguese governor, Alves Aldeia, to invite El Tari to visit Timor-Leste. And El Tari came. So I went to Kupang on my way to Jakarta. And uh, El Tari uh, then told one of his assistants, you accompany Ramos, he called me Ramos, to Jakarta. He cannot travel alone, you have to help him. So, and that gentleman, his name is Luis Taoli. Luis Taoli accompanied me to Jakarta. But when we went to Jakarta, Luis Taoli disappeared. I never saw him again. <laughs> He also found himself in Jakarta and started enjoying Jakarta and forgot about me. And who helped me in Jakarta? Hari Kawilaran, a journalist with uh, Sinar Harapang. Uh, Saban Siajian, uh, later Jakarta Post. George Adijondro, Tempo. At the time, George was with Tempo. I don't remember how I managed to meet Adam Malik. I didn't know anyone. I don't even remember how I made a contact. I just remember I met with Adam Malik. Uh, I didn't even go in a car. Hari Kwailaran took me in his motorbike <laughs> to meet Adam Malik in his uh, residence. Adam Malik was the foreign minister of Indonesia, very famous. <laughs> and, uh, so, but he received me very well, Adam Malik. And I met him three times during the, those days. And, uh, and I told like this to Adam Malik, Pak Malik, you are very well known in Timor-Leste. Well, I was lying, you know, uh, he was not well known, maybe to me and to al -Kathiri. yeah. But, uh, you know, who would know about <laughs> Adam Malik? And uh, if you do a, a message, for me to take to Portuguese Timor, we used to call it Portuguese Timor. I take back home to read to the people. Everybody would be happy and uh, to understand Indonesia position. Because at that time, Adam Malik was supporting self explanation for Timor. And uh, so Adam Malik agreed to do the letter. The third day I went there to get the letter. And he signed in front of me. I took the letter, put, came back to Dili, and uh, there was a first public meeting of ICDT in Dili, and I explained to everybody, I read the letter for Madame Malik. That was my first diplomatic 
success. That was June. July I went to Canberra. God, no money again. From here to Darwin, I had only the ticket. I have to say, uh, I didn't have money because I, the lady in the flight, she came to me, asked whether I wanted to drink something. And I said, orange juice. She brought me an orange juice. I thought it was free. She said, one dollar. I didn't have one dollar. But then I said, I made a big lie. And I'm sure uh, she knew I was lying. Because I said, do you have a change for $500? <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, would she believe I have $500? Not even, she believe I have $100. But if I said $10, yes, I have change. If I have, say, $100, she might also have a change. I thought rapidly. So I have to say, I, do you have change for $500? She said, no. Then the, a gentleman sitting next to me, an Australian, he probably understood. He said, no problem, I pay, I buy your orange juice. <laughs> I arrived in Darwin, my brother Arsini was there, he was working there. And to go to Canberra, Arsini, uh, please lend me $500. I need to go to Canberra. So he gave me $500. So that's how our diplomacy. So I met with people in, Mel in Canberra, Melbourne, Sydney. Uh, I cannot forget one, Jim Dunn, who passed away recently. Great man. I met him first when he was a consul here. I was only, I don't remember how old I was, 15 years old. I met him on a Sunday morning uh, in Balidi, in, uh, near Lahani and uh, near Balidi church. He was cutting a tree, <laughs> you know. One tree fell on the road. He was cutting a big tree. And I approached him, Mr. Consul, Mr. Consul. Uh, there, there. And I showed him the way, you don't have to cut the tree. You just turn around, I showed to Taibesi, then down Santa Cruz. <laughs> I just, just, because my English was very limited. He understood. And then he went in his car, and uh, although he was uh, cutting him, because he was very young, you know, Australians are very informal, you know, he t took out his big, uh, you know, machado, you know, and started cutting. If he, st if, if he had kept on cutting, cutting, it would be the whole day he wouldn't finish. <laughs> it's a big tree. That's how we met first time. And I went to Canberra, he invited me to stay in his home with his wife, his two children, and we became friends ever since. And uh, he's like an uncle for me, like a father, and uh, always looking after me. That's how it started. And, uh, but let me say again, Nicola Lobato sent us to go to abroad. But how did we go? No planes, like now. You know, with the coronavirus, uh, Air North, uh, the only one, I mean, no plane to Indonesia, I couldn't go to Indonesia, no plane to Singapore. Because at the time, before the invasion, the government, Australian government already prohibited any planes from coming to Timor. So I called some friends in Australia. One was, um, the late member of parliament, Ken Fry. The other one, uh, <clears throat> a friend called David Scott, very good man. I told them, I said, listen, we need a plane to go to Darwin and to Europe and to the United Nations. So they talked to the then foreign minister of Australia, Andrew Peacock. And because I knew Andrew Peacock already, and he became a friend of mine, and they told Andrew Peacock, in these exact words, if you don't allow a plane to go to East Timor to pick up Ramos Orta, he will be captured by the Indonesians and will kill him, they will kill him. It will be on your conscience. It's your chance to save him. That's how they, they use a, a psychological pressure on Andrew Peacock. 
so a plane came. On the 4th of December, 9 a.m., I received a call from uh, Canberra. A plane on its way, go to the airport. So, me, Maria Alcatiri, uh, Roger Lobato, we rushed to the airport. Uh, and to Darwin, then Sydney, and Sydney to, I think, Singapore, Bahrain, London and Lisbon. In Lisbon to take care of visa for United States. I was two or three days in Lisbon and then me and Abilo Araujo to New York. So that's the beginning of a long uh, journey until 99. At first I thought it going to be easy. We come back maybe one month, one month, one month, one month. Every year, you dreaming about going back, coming back. What was the biggest challenge in your fight, in your struggle uh, within the UN for Timor's independence? Yes. The problem, Timor very far away, very small, no strategic importance. Then you have the Cold War, the war in Vietnam, you have uh, the absolute lack of information. When Indonesian troops landed here, hundreds were killed that same day. Roger East, for instance. Why Roger East came to Timor? I was the one who went to Darwin and talked to him, please come and help to set up a new service. And me and him, we set it up. I was the one who gave the name East Timor News Agency. And a joke with Roger East. East is in honor of you, Roger East. So East Timor News Agency. Because at the time, Antara dominated. No other independent agency here. So Roger East came. And uh, we went to New York and very little. The invasion had some coverage in Australia, not even front page, I think, in the New York Times. The distance, the relative unimportance of Timor in terms of economics, oil, strategic, not Kuwait, you know, we are not rich like Kuwait. And that was the main difficulty, because if you don't have information, but information with pictures, and preferable with video, with film. At the time, very difficult to have uh, pictures, let alone films. So difficult to explain uh, to people. That was, but we never gave up. We went on and on and on. Uh, I would go to journalists, I talk to them, they don't publish. I go to churches. I talked to the church, and some they help a bit, making a statement. I go to Washington, because my work was, when I was in New York, was not only the UN. A lot in Washington, back and forth, all the time. Uh, because I knew the power rested in Washington, the power rests in the US Congress. So I cultivate people in the US Congress. There again, very difficult, because Indonesia was very influential during the Cold War period. A lot has been written and reported, filmed about you. What has the media not reported or written about you? Well, uh, there are some films. One is called uh, The Diplomat. One called Buried Alive, before that by Gil Skrein, The Diplomat is by Tom Zibriski. There is a French movie also about me called um, La Voix de Ramos Horta, La Voix de la Résistance. Ramos Horta, The Voice of the Resistance. I know they did, because they followed me for two, two years filming, and then, but I never saw the film. And many others, uh, interviews and uh, so on. You know, uh, I did all of that uh, yeah, to, uh, it's my obligation. 
And you know, you want to promote a cause. Like today, you want to promote the environment cause. You have to talk to the media. And easier today than before. If you want to promote your political struggle, you have to use the media to reach public opinion. More difficult at that time. So when journalists start, you know, many filmmakers start approaching me, they, because they know me, they watch me, they get interested, uh, curious about this person. So I did for my country, I do. I give an example. When uh, they did the film The Diplomat, I told them, before you release the film, I want to see it. I want to reserve the right to delete anything that I don't like. They say, we accept. They began filming in 1997, 96. They followed me in 96, 97, 98, 99. They came with me to Timor. They followed me in December. Because when they began filming, they didn't know. We didn't know Timor was going to be free. So they kept filming. So when the film was ready, uh, they finished, Timur was free. I didn't care about the film any longer. I said. So I, and they edited, and they did, uh, I did ask them, I want to see it before. I didn't care. Then I went to Melbourne and Sydney for the film festival. So when I saw the film, I was very embarrassed because uh, in the film, it's called The Diplomat, but I say so many bad words. Many times, like 20 times, I was said, said in, in English, I cannot repeat because it's television, you know, uh, but uh, 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 a word in English that you use the letter F a lot. And uh, in Portuguese also letter F. And, uh, so I said, oh God, and uh, uh, so embarrassing. Uh, but uh, I had, uh, I no longer care about the film. Timur is free, it's done. And to finish, what would you want to do? What is your dream thing to do for the rest of your life for Timur? Well, you know, we are facing now extraordinary challenges. Who would imagine that in 2020 we literally begin the year with one of the worst uh, health crises in humanity's history, and it is just beginning. And because this is globalization, a disease that happens somewhere, in this case happened in a province in China, quickly spread around the world. Why? Well, because of world economics, because of global economics, because of that, hundreds of millions of people move each day everywhere. Tens of millions fly every day throughout the world. So people carry diseases as well because even before coronavirus, if you travel in an airplane, you think no problems in the plane? No, if someone in the plane has cholera, he didn't know about beginning, well, everybody will be infected. If he has tuberculosis, the air conditioning system of the plane will spread it. The new planes in the last 20 years, they are better. But in before, the air circulating in the plane was repeating. You are not breathing new air. In the air, you keep the same air. Uh, now, with the new engineering, more strict, most planes change 100%. It's clean. But before, no. The legionnaire disease. You know, one day, one plane arrived in London uh, because before people didn't know, because many people always get sick when you f travel, but each one goes to his home. But that particular occasion, many years ago, I don't remember, maybe 40 years ago, more than 100 people became sick. 
Well, they found out. They came sick from the airplane. Everybody got sick from the airplane because of the air. So, nowadays, coronavirus, before coronavirus was uh, SARS, after SARS, MERS, avian flu. So that has to do with globalization. And this uh, coronavirus also provoking the worst recession ever, global economic recession. Of course, countries like the United States, powerful, they are considering investing more than two trillion dollars to deal with corona, coronavirus in the United States and to recover the economy. Europe, the president of the Central, European Central Bank just announced a few days ago 800 million euros. Billion, 800 billion euros, so more than basically one trillion dollars for coronavirus and economic support in Europe. Well, I hope that our government will have a division, the courage to fight on two fronts. One, on the coronavirus front, to save as many people as we can if it becomes epidemic in Timor, but also rescue the economy. You cannot focus only on the virus. You have to simultaneously focus on economics, because otherwise you can survive the virus, but the economy completely disappear, and people are poorer, hungry, and so on. So, if the government has to use two billion dollars for the twin approach, I call it two-track approach, coronavirus and the economy. And the economy is not just the economy as such, it means also nutrition, agriculture, food security, help the private sector. We have to help the Timorese private sector. The banks have to also come in to forgive the debt of everybody. If I were the bank, BNU, Mandiri, BNCTL, I would say eliminate the debt. We all contribute. In some cases, maybe the government inject money in the banks because the <coughs> and they help those Timorese who produce goods for us to eat. Bring things from the villages to Dili, bring things from Dili to the villages, subsidize petrol. Uh, the microlets are now no passengers. How we can help the microlets? How can we help the taxis? How can we help uh, the hotels? Because the hotels are empty. Maybe they are foreigners, but they invest their money here. We should help so that they can survive, so they don't close down. Maybe we give them a free electricity for everybody. Because Hotel Timur alone, every month they pay $30,000 electricity bill. 30000 no tourists, no hotel closed down. And they have more than 100 people or 200 people working there. So how can we help Timorese and non-Timorese private sector so that they continue to pay the salaries of every Timorese? How can we help taxi drivers? How can we help Microlet, Angunas? And that means maybe we need $1 billion, maybe two. Why we keep the money in U.S. Treasury bonds to help the American economy? They don't need it. So that's the world situation. If the government has vision, uh, has courage and support by all of us, we can use this opportunity, this crisis, health crisis, economic crisis, for Timor to, one year from now, a miracle.
because it requires uh, audacious, courageous, visionary leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you and God bless you all, you in uh, <coughs> this program and uh, throughout GMN and uh, to the espectadores. One hour is far from enough to hear all the stories of the Torah Mazorta. Sad, happy, and sometimes funny, and it all contributes to his great diplomacy work. I believe we are eager to hear more, and wish for another chance to hear the stories that he has not been able to share with us in this episode. But until then, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the program, and I'll see you on the next episode of Diplomata. I'm Francis Suni. Bye for now.